Okay, so if I just hold this wheel up, I'm sure that many of you will be able to observe the fact it's a Mavic wheel. Mavic, of course, is a name that's synonymous with cycling. Its iconic black and yellow branding has been everywhere throughout the sport. Now, although these days Mavic actually make excellent cycling shoes, helmets, and even pedals, what they really earned their fame for was being one of the longest standing wheel manufacturers in cycling. Now, over the years, Mavic has engineered and pioneered some amazing technology on their wheels and their rims, including SUP technology, ceramic coated rims, and of course, the world famous UST tubeless system. Now, SUP rims really were a game changer as far as rim technology goes. Now, traditionally, rims are pinned together and occasionally they'd be welded together, and you'd be left with a wheel that's perfectly good all the way around, except for the join. And you could have a bit of hop in there, you could have a bit of side to side. Either way, it didn't feel very good if you were braking with a rim brake back in the day, or if you're a mechanic having to lace those wheels up in the first place. Now, SUP technology changed that completely by welding the rim together and then machining that weld down, leaving a perfectly smooth and precise rim. Now, this was fantastic if you had rim brakes. This particular rim is a 321, so this is one of the early downhill rims that was designed for disc brakes. There was also the 521, which was the rim brake version, which had a slightly deeper sidewall. And these were SUP technology rims. Now, it had an absolutely perfect braking surface, and they were renowned as being excellent rims to lace up because they were so straight to start with. Now, although this particular rim doesn't have it, they had a 121 rim which had ceramic coating on it. Now, the ceramic coating in those days was amazing for, for two purposes, uh, in particular on mountain bikes. Now, the first one was the fact that it was quite a coarse coating, so it actually adhered to brake pads really, really well and really basically it gave you extreme braking power. Well, as extreme as you could get with cantilevers and V-brakes in those earlier days. But the other thing it also did was give a surface onto the outside of the rim. It would resist wear. Now, if you think a braking surface on a rim by today's standards sounds a bit mad, you're actually wearing out the structure of the rim as you're braking. So to actually enhance that and basically make it a stronger rim in the first place, this is what the ceramic coated did. And it was absolutely fantastic, although it was quite expensive. Now, of course, there is the UST technology as well. UST stands for Universal Standard Tubeless. Now, this was something that Mavic, being a French company, teamed up with Hutchinson and Michelin, also French companies, but specializing in rubber, and they teamed up together to make a universal tubeless standard. And this is absolutely crucial at the time because there wasn't really anything like it, and it needed a wheel manufacturer to work in conjunction with a tire manufacturer to do this. So not only did they design and pioneer the valve core system for inflating the rim, they got the rim bed system where it's a sealed rim bed, so there's no way of air getting through to where the spoke nipples penetrate that. And of course, the hook technology for getting that tire on there in the first place. Now, the reason for working directly with Hutchinson and Michelin was the fact that they could develop tires to work specifically with rims like this. And those tires obviously had to be able to hold an air pressure in there regardless of the sealant that was going into there to create a completely tubeless system. Now, UST, you've seen tubeless going everywhere, but this is where it started. And I think it's one of the most important things that any cycling company has done. But it's not just rims that Mavic have been refining all these years. They've actually been making hubs since 1975. Being a hub manufacturer and a rim manufacturer, it wasn't gonna take them too long before they started wheeling out what they call the global system. So complete and optimized wheel packages. That first started in 1994 with the Cosmic range of wheels, that's the road wheels, and then followed later in 1996 with the Crossmax series of wheels. Of course, this is one of the later sets of Crossmax wheels. Today though, we're actually just gonna be looking at hubs because it's such an important part of the wheel. So let's go back to the very beginning. In fact, to 1975, where the Mavic 500 hubs came onto the scene. Now, they might look quite pretty simple to you, but actually these hubs worked a lot better than many hubs, often a decade later than these. Now, in this sort of era, these sort of hubs tended to be cup and cone design. Now, one of the problems with cup and cone bearings is that if you over tighten them, you strain the bearing there, you can pit the bearing surfaces. If you ride them loose, it does the same. And of course, they have additional friction if you ride them loose and the bearing surfaces get damaged or if you ride them tight. And the same thing happens when they get pitted, you get bumpy bearing surface. Now, another downside of the traditional cup and cone bearing system is that they would loosen. 
slightly as you rode. Now this, depending on how often you rode and the sort of surfaces you rode on, this could be a ride or it could be several rides. Now a cup and cone bearings worked very well provided you like to maintain your bike. Now it's not something that everyone likes to do and it's not something that everyone is good at doing. And Maverick quickly identified this. So actually in these particular hubs, even from 1975, they had sealed radial bearings in them. Now something that's especially good about Mavic using these sealed radial bearings are that one of the weaknesses of traditional cup and cones are they put a slight angular force onto the bearings as you preloaded them, which actually could prematurely wear those bearings. The sealed radial bearings don't actually have that problem and they are immensely smooth. Really, really quite ahead of their time actually. But something else you're gonna notice about this is how different it is to a modern mountain bike hub. So if I just take this one off a D-Max wheel here, look at the difference. Not just talking about the size, but the layout of the hub. You see this one has a screw-on style fitting here, whereas this one has a much more familiar Shimano style pattern where the cassette would slide on and screw onto the end there. Now the screw-on system, there wasn't any moving parts in the hub. The hub simply had bearings and seals and an axle, no problem at all. The bearings, however, were sat directly under the flanges. There wasn't a bearing, an outboard one at the end here. So the hub could suffer from strain there. And also, if there was flex, that can create friction at the bearing in a hub, which of course will wear it out prematurely, cause additional friction. None of that stuff is any good. Now, unlike the traditional cassettes you see these days that literally slide onto the hub and are held on with a lock ring, or in the SRAM case, they, they push on and screw on. These ones are a little bit different. They had a separate free hub body. In fact, I'm just gonna show you. They have a separate freewheel system. And these things weighed a ton compared to what you see nowadays because they've got bearings and pulls inside here. So this would screw onto the hub itself. It's threaded on the inside and it's threaded there. Now, these things worked quite well, but they were prone to problems. They had quite a lot of friction in them. Now, due to the amount of stuff there is going on in the inside of here, you're very restricted in how small a smaller sprocket you can go for. So to compensate for that, the bikes using these tended to have much bigger chain rings up front to give you a big gear range. Of course, when it comes to mountain biking, you want a smaller chain ring for the ground clearance, and you want a smaller small gear and a bigger big gear out back. Now, there's a quite limiting in the way that it could be designed, and of course, there was flaws in the hub system as well because it wasn't supported as well. Now, it wasn't uncommon in these days, no matter what brand you're running, to see these sort of hubs, the axles bending and sometimes breaking due to the additional strain the mountain biking would put to them. I mean, these particular ones are the road hubs, but they did do a mountain bike version of them. Now, I just wanna show you the difference between the fitting on an old style screw on, what they called a block, and a new style cassette where it slides on. So as I've just explained, you have the simple screw on system that is all in one. When it wears out, you replace it. And that also has the pulls inside there. Now with the system you're far more familiar with, you have a cassette which is often in multiple pieces and it simply slides on. we we'll just find the, the biggest slot here. There's this one. They simply slide on, all the pieces slide on and then they're held on to the end with a lock ring. It's a nice simple system. The mechanism is actually on the inside here. This part of the hub can be removed. There'll be two bearings in here and there'll be bearings supporting the axle. So the whole system gives much more support. It's a much better system, especially for mountain biking, but of course, road bikes also use this system now. Now the cassette hub, there's so much of it, there's just so much better. There's Four bearings in there in general, so much more support, a lot more durability, they're better sealed and much, much stronger. So when it came to designing cassette style hubs like these, Mavic were pretty radical, even from the off. And they had a lot of technology in the hubs that other people hadn't even considered using. Now this particular hub, you can look here, you can see the drive side flange is a lot bigger than the non-drive side flange. And the reason for that is it can accept shorter spokes, which means it's stronger and stiffer. Now, they're also geared up for a different lacing pattern. Now, Mavic used their own trademark Zycral spokes, which was their own trademarked alloy. Now, they were huge, fat spokes. They're very light, but also very strong. One of the benefits of using those spokes, especially in the radial pattern as seen on this particular hub, was that they could get the spoke line really close to the cassette without fouling it. And of course, the wider the bracing angle is, of course, means for a stronger and more tensioned wheel. 
On the non drive side, they tended to use two cross. So if I just show you this on a pre built wheel here, so this is Cross Max Enduro, and as you can see here on the drive side, it's got that bigger flange with the radial spokes. And then on the non drive side, slightly different, two cross spokes on here. Now, as well as having fairly radical spokes options with their own brand spokes there, and of course doing two cross and radial patterns, it was a number of spokes that freaked people out too. Now, this particular wheel is a rear wheel and it has only 20 spokes on it. And you think a normal spoked mountain bike wheel back in those days would have had 32 or even 36 spokes, which could be stainless steel as well. These were alloy. So really, really advanced stuff there. Now, there was a whole bunch of other things that they had where other hub manufacturers were offering quick release or bolt through or 20 mil or this or that. Mavic were very quick to have adaptive systems that you could change to suit 135s or 142s and everything else. So it's a really adaptable system, which of course is much better for the end user. Now also Mavic used to have sealed bearings in all of their hubs. So you had no issues with that sort of stuff in there and they never suffered because they're radial bearings from having any angular load to them like you could get in some of those cup and cone systems. Now, in the early days, their hubs, you would adjust the preload on them, but they learned that whilst that worked excellently, it could be over adjusted, you could tighten them too much. Likewise, they could be ridden when they were loose. So the later hubs came with what's called the QRS Auto Preload System. Now this system is fantastic because it means the bearing is at the optimum preload at all times. So you're not gonna wear the bearing through anything other than just old age, really. It's a really, really good system. Now, as far as the internals of the hubs go, Mavic have always had their ITS system, which is instant transfer system. Now, in the past, they've had two pool systems, but I wanna show you the ITS4, which is the most recent incarnation of that, and that's as featured inside this particular hub here. Now, it's a very simple and effective system where you have four pools on springs here. Now, they're staggered, so it means that there's always two engaged every time. It's not a case of none engaged and then all engaged as they spring around. And simply put, these just engage into a ratchet that's on the inside of the hub. That is simply a seal there to keep all the grime out. It's a very simple and effective system. However, this system, as excellent as it is, does need maintenance on it. Because of the fact that the pools are on springs, over time, those springs do need replacing because they can get a bit baggy and not actually do their job as well as they should do with pushing the spring into the ratchet there. And of course, if you were to put thick grease or something in there, they could slip. But generally, it's a really, really good system. And this is the most refined version of that with those staggered pools. So I'm just gonna pull this hub apart here so you can see the inside. I loosened this earlier. It's not normally this loose just so you can see, take the end cap off and then just with a gentle pull, you can see it's the same as this one. And then if I just release it carefully, you can see it's the same again. And you can see on the inside here where those pulls sit into that ratchet and allow it to freewheel or engage that hub. It's a pretty good system. It's always worked really effectively, but that with the two always engaged is far more reliable than earlier systems. The key for any sort of intricate machinery like this is the fact it has to be cleaned and well lubricated in order to work reliably all the time. Of course, we're not all like that. And as Mavic knew from the hub days when they started using cartridge bearings instead of using cup and cone bearings, people don't wanna be maintaining their bikes all the time. So as good as the ITS4 system is, and it still does work very well, Mavic were interested in developing a new system that didn't have to rely on people looking after it as much. Now, as we know, Mavic are masters at refining their products throughout their entire range. And this is the latest version of their hub. So on the inside of this hub, a little bit different from the old style ITS4 system, is the brand new ID360. ID stands for instant drive, and this is all new. Now, Mavic have actually been developing the ID360 system since 2013, and it's been used on our skinny wheeled road bike friends' bikes since 2016, and now it's finally been adapted and ready for mountain bike use. Unlike the DT system, which has the two ratchets and twin springs, the Mavic system just has a single spring. So let's have a look at it. Okay, so this is the free hub body. Listen to this. 
almost instant engagement. There's 40 points of engagement on this, and it's just nine degrees between them. That's such a fast pickup. Now, I'm just gonna release the spring on this so you can see how this works on the inside here, and take this apart. So, you have the part that sits into the hub with one set of the ratchet rings on it. You have the other ratchet ring that rotates against it, and you have the spring that sits on the inside the frail body. It's that simple. And I'm just gonna show you this on the inside of the hub, just like I did with the other one. Just gonna pull this end plug off, and literally pull this apart. There we go. There's the spring, there's the ratchet, and there's the other one on the inside of the hub there. Very simple system. As you can see, the ratchet is pushed away from the hub, allowing it to freewheel, and when you go the other way, it engages. Now, I've also got this really cool cutaway hub here, so you can see the axle, you can see the bearings. If you look closely, you can see these ratchets, and as I rotate this, you'll see it engaging with that single spring, just making it come into use there. Very cool. Okay, so let's look at the fundamentals of this ID360 system. So of course there's 40 points of engagement, it's positive engagement, it's basically always ready to be engaged, no chance of slippage there. There's nine degrees of rotation between the engagements, which is tiny, however, it's not too small. So the bearings on the inside, obviously they're premium bearings and they don't have any angular sort of load concerns to them. And also note how outboard those bearings are. Of course, because of the ratchet mechanism, the inner one is slightly on the inside here. The outboard one here is very, very close to the outside here. And again, on the actual free hub part of the body there. You might also notice that the system has an oversized hub. Now, most people tend to have a 15 millimeter axle in their hubs, but Mavic with the ID360 system have a 17 millimeter axle. Now, two millimeters might not sound a lot to you, but it makes a significant difference. And all you've got to think is with all of those twisting forces that go into bikes, especially today with the way they're ridden, I'm talking enduro bikes, trail bikes, jump bikes, downhill bikes, all of that stuff. When you're throwing those bikes into turns, everything is twisting. And as soon as there's twisting and flex in something like a wheel axle, that's going to create a load on bearings and other parts that is not good. Now, this system has been designed to cope with all of the stresses of modern day bikes. And two of the particular things that are included in that are e-bikes. Of course, they put a significant amount of strain and torque through a rear wheel axle like this. This axle laughs at it, no problem with that. Also, another thing to bring up is the enormous 51 tooth teeth sprockets you get on some rear cassettes these days. Now, they put a significant sort of load into a hub. And again, with this system combined with that ratchet, it's no problem at all. You're never gonna slip and that axle can handle the strain. Now, what I can feel here that you're gonna to have to just listen to is a really, really nice crispness. Now, there's actually 50% more torsional rigidity in this system than a conventional ITS4 pull waste system. So you've only got to think how efficient that's gonna be under power. Now, also, there's the noise thing to take into consideration. Obviously, with the outside of the hub, that is extremely loud and extremely positive. You know that that is in. But with the cutaway system here, it's far more muted. And then with the actual hub itself, when it's completely sealed in, it's actually quite discreet. It's definitely crisp enough to know you're in the whole time, but it's not too distracting on the ride. I actually really like the fact it's not super loud. I've been quite liking the quiet bike thing of late, and we're starting to see it more and more, of course, clutch derailleurs and stuff. It's all about making your bike as quiet as possible. And that's one of those things that's gonna start reducing noise, but obviously there's no chance of slipping or anything. It's a really, really good positive system. There's also a severe lack of friction in this. Normally, the only friction you would feel on this sort of style system would be the actual ratchet itself and then the seal. But the seal is a non-contact seal, so you don't feel that anyway. And the only thing you feel is literally the ratchet against itself, which I can tell you is very reassuring. Now that about summarizes the hub, but also they're about 40 grams lighter. So not only does it outperform the old and the more conventional ITS4 system, but it is a slight bit lighter. Now something else I just found out about these, obviously Mavic is a French company. They hail from Annecy in the French Alps there, and they actually make their hubs in Europe, which is quite nice. Now it still looks like a modern wheel to me, and I know how well these ride, because this is actually one of my personal wheels from another bike. 
But I find it quite amazing that Mavic, in particular, the way they like to refine their products through time, like this is still great, up to date, and still works. But the latest one, if I just show you the XA35 Carbon, the Pro Wheel, this is the latest one. And this, of course, has got that ID360 hub on there. It's got two cross designed on both sides, 24 spokes. It's got the carbon rims on here, which is set for anything from 2.5 up to 3.2 inch tires. Nice stable support, it's UST as you'd expect. As with the newer wheels from Mavic, it's part of the WTS system, so it's a wheel tire system, so a whole lot with tires involved in the formula there too. I think it's really impressive that the fact that they don't just sit on the fact that this stuff is excellent and works, they're always looking to refine and make stuff better, the longevity of stuff. Now, something I haven't mentioned yet that I really, really like about this new ID360 system is that this is gonna appear on all Mavic wheels soon. So it's already out there in the wild on some of their wheels, but I think the point I wanna make is that on some manufacturers' wheels, you will see the pull system be continued to use on maybe slightly more budget wheels, and they'll use a ratchet system on the slightly more expensive wheels. Whereas I love the fact that Mavic they totally believe in where they're going with the ratchet system, and that is gonna be on all wheels. So whether you're riding a $200 set of wheels or a $2,000 set of wheels, you're gonna get the same performance, the same longevity, and the same technology in there. So there you go, that was a little story about Mavic, the French wheel manufacturer. I hope you like the little story there. As always, click on the round globe to subscribe to GMBN Tech. We love having you guys around. And if you give this video a thumbs up, which I hope you will, don't forget to hit the bell feature as well, because it gives you a little notification every time we post a rad video. As always, give us a thumbs up. Cheers, guys.